Hello, I'm Marsha Barnhart. This is API Conversations Part 2 with Cheryl Costa, co-author of The UFO Sightings Desk Reference. On our last API Conversations, I spoke with Cheryl about her book, UFO Sightings Desk Reference, and how it came to be. We discussed her background in various fields that created in her the multiple disciplines that enabled the gathering, data crunching, and graphic representation of the desk reference. Her book has been very well received it has now enabled those in UFO studies to better make sense of disparate data while conducting research and investigations. It is telling that she was presented the Researcher of the Year Award at the 2018 International UFO Conference in February held in Arizona. When talking with Cheryl, it became apparent that one conversation was not going to do it. Talking with her was so revealing that it led from one path down another and then yet down another. So here in part two of API Conversations with Cheryl Costa, we talk about her online UFO column, New York Skies, and about her background in the practices of shamanism, Buddhism, and remote viewing. All three of these seeming to dovetail into the areas of mind and consciousness study and relating tangentially to her interest in the UFO phenomenon. This conversation, part two, was recorded on March 23rd, 2018. I started off by asking her how she came to write the online column about UFOs in New York State. Well, I'd always read everything I ever saw in a magazine or somebody passed me along a dog-eared book with, about UFOs. I would look at it, okay? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And I was always sort of interested in it, but I never really thought about getting into it, so to speak. And um, one night, it was November 5th, 2012. Uh, we were, I was at working at a different newspaper in the technical department. We had just put the production to bed. The presses were rolling. All we had to do was wait like 90 minutes, two hours to print off the morning paper, and then I could go home. And I was just sitting there waiting for the pressman to finish running the the edition. And I looked online, and I was looking at a CNN.com story, and there was this little sidebar article that said, UFOs have been declining since the 80s. Maybe they were always just an urban legend. Hmm. And I looked at that headline in that secondary line, and I said, that doesn't sound right. So I went out to the National UFO Reporting Center website, first time ever been there, pulled some yearly yearly totals over 20 years and stuck them into a spreadsheet and put a plot on it. And it went up like a rocket. Huh. And I'm going, they're not declining. If nothing else, they're, 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 they're accelerating upwards. I mean, what memo didn't the UFOs get? You know, and I'm going, this is misinformation. So I, I started reading some of these reports and follow on nights. The rest of that week, I, I went back out to the site and started looking at what people were saying because, you know, I, I sort of believe what other people had been saying. Oh, it's just UFO kooks and nuts and, you know, that kind of thing. And I started reading it. And most of these people were just very, very sincere, just trying to get it off their chest because they had nobody else they could tell. Mm-hmm. And he thought they thought it was their duty to report what they saw. Mm-hmm. And so I took some of these and I. I punched them up a little bit. I I can't tell you who they are because that information is not in the report. Uh And I can't tell you why they are. If I did, if I knew why UFOs are, I'd be getting a Nobel Prize. But I can tell you what, what, when and where. Mm -hmm. So I I wrote about five stories up, punched them up a little bit. If if it said, hey, me and my girlfriend were on the uh, hood of our car watching the sky, I'd say, hey, Bob and Susie were on the hood of their car, you know. But, um... I took it around to about 12 editors, and I got laughed out of the office, thrown out of the office. I got escorted to the door by security. You know, nobody wanted to talk to me. 
one editor says to me, oh, what brand of tinfoil do you wear? You know, and that was the attitude. Yeah. And then I, I kind of a last shot. I went over and talked to this one weekly paper. And this is Syracuse New Times. And uh, at the time, Larry Dietrich was the uh, the uh, editor in chief. And and I had known Larry from the other newspaper because he was a he was a copy editor over there originally. And I went to him and I said, I got this column. I want to write about UFOs in New York State. Before he would even look at my my three, four, five pages of proposal, he got me a cup of coffee, sat there behind his desk and said, let's talk about UFOs. And this guy had read about everything I had ever read. And uh, so we, at, by the end of a 30 minute conversation, he said, I'm sympathetic. Uh-huh. He says, tell you what, let's try your articles for a month and see what happens. If we don't like them. We'll take them down. Uh-huh. I said, OK, fine. That was fair. A month later, he calls me up and says, come on into the office. We need to talk. I thought, oh, that's it. It's over with, you know. And I get in there. I'm a little bit late because I had a little trouble getting a park, place to park in their parking lot. And I come into the meeting about five, five minutes late. I walk into the meeting and he looks over and he says, ah, oh, there's Cheryl. There's our rock star. You're getting more page views than all of our columnists combined. Ha, huh, take and that. It went, up, it went up from there. Huh. Isn't that interesting that mainstream media had no idea how interested the public is in stories of that nature? Yeah. And what was wild was because they were being posted on an online edition, Uh huh. my digital editor, mm-hmm. uh, a guy by the name of Ty Marshall, Ty came along one day and he says, you know what's wild? He says, you get a certain number of viewings on the weekend right after your article gets posted on Friday. But he says, they keep growing because they're out there on the internet and those numbers keep accumulating over the weeks and months. Hmm. And uh, that surprised us. And uh, so there was kind of a perpetual audience there. And you're getting international, international, right? uh, Yeah, I had a certain amount of international and that's grown. That's uh-huh. grown significantly. At one point, we did a. They did. They had software. They could go out there and see where all this stuff was coming from. Yeah. And I had I had hundreds of people all over Western and Eastern Europe reading my column. God. And I had I had about a hundred people in Asia reading my column. You mm. know, in fact, I've got um, I've got a hell of a following in Vietnam. <laughs> you know, of all places. <laughs> wow. I've reached out to them a couple of times on their Facebook page. The ones who read my column. Right. And I'll actually take the time to run whatever I'm writing through the translator to make it Vietnamese. And they thought that was great. Well, sure. You know? Yeah. And um, so, um, so that's where it went. That's how come the column went. Uh-huh. Uh, after the book came out last April, editors came to me. They were getting phone calls from the New York Times. They were getting phone calls from the Times of London. Everybody was talking, talking to them about my book. Hmm. So they, uh, editor came to me and said, Hey, uh, the, editor-in-chief wants to do a story about you and as it turned out when they finally ran it it was more like october right. about seven months later but what they ran was uh the photographer was up here for four hours taking pictures and uh, what they ended up running was a feature story where i was the cover story and four pages worth of news inside and they went back to all my articles I'd written over the first four years, got quotes out of those, plus the editor had sat me down over a cup of coffee and, and got um, uh, asked me additional questions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, uh, you first came to my attention when I had read an article that somebody had crunched a bunch of data and was able to make charts and graphs out of input from MUFON and New Fork. And, and my little radar went ding, 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 because I had been <laughs> looking for something like that for so long. And here it was. And so that's when I first read about the project that you and Linda did. And then I started reading because then from that, I found out that you did New York Skies, that column. Now, when you do that column, Cheryl. How do you approach it? Do people write you with stories? Do you go out and hit move on raw move on reports and and kind of do a riff on that, or how do you do that column exactly for the input? Um, if I'm just writing a UFO story, um, I go out to uh, I usually go out to the National UFO Reporting Center. Uh-huh. It's a little easier to get into it. Yeah, and I'll go through and I'll I'll sit there over a cup of coffee and read through a bunch of different reports. If something catches my eye. I'll print, I'll cut and paste it into a, a word pad type thing. I'll read it out a few times and then I'll, I'll start doing my own thing with it. 
Uh-huh. And that's okay. just that's just New York and, State data, right? You're just gathering New York State data. Well, new, off New Four. Up up until about last spring, uh, my editor let me go national, mm-hmm. so I started writing uh, sky stories about other other states and other municipalities, and that's been fun. Yeah. Because um, I was starting to run out of things to write about in New York State. Not that we didn't have a lot of sightings, mm-hmm. but um, there's only a certain amount of those sightings that bubble up to really interesting kind uh, of thing. Yeah. So I started reaching out to other states. And what's been fun there is because I don't know much about the state. I'll open up a Wikipedia or something like that. And I'll look up, you know, guy says, hey, this was in 1930 something. I'll look up what was the population in that county or that town in 1930, and mm. I'll add that information uh-huh, into the uh-huh. column. Back back in the day, this is how much population they had, and this is how rural it was, and uh-huh. that type of thing. And nowadays, they have this population, and da 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 da. I got and, you. And uh, so it's not only the UFO. I try to give statistics about how big an area of the, the municipality is. Okay. All right. So now, you know, um, on the subject of New Fork and Vietnam, it seems like New Fork is starting to beef up its international input, too. You know, they have other the international stuff when you when you go to New Fork, but looking up the international reports. I We've gotten a fair amount of reports, aerial phenomenon investigations team from India, Cheryl. Yeah, it's, um, it's actually, everywhere. Uh, actually, I've spent the last two weeks crunching the international data from uh, New Fork. Uh, oh, really? Uh, it, yeah, uh, it, it, it's tricky. Thank God I had a, a, a information technology background, you know, d- a computer center data back, background. Yeah. Um, I ended up having to write a little bit of code because the way they do it, they don't give you a uh, – like if you're looking at a normal United States sighting thing, you got the city, you got this a column with the state, you uh-huh. got the date, the time, and the shape and all that kind of stuff, and then the explanation, okay? right. right. The international, what they've got up there for like the location is the, you'll see the name of the city and then in parentheses, usually parentheses, you'll see the name of the country. Sometimes you just see the name of the country. Sometimes they'll have another parentheses in there saying rural or, or you know, uh, you know, 10 miles north of such and such, you know, oh, yeah. and uh, it's hard to pick that data out. So I wrote code to extract city and country out of most of those sightings. And I got like about a 90% extract rate. And I've been going through in the last week or so, cleaning up that other 10% to, to you know, to, to get, maybe there was an extra set of parentheses in there, or maybe there was no city listed. And in that case, I put unspecified, you know, that kind of thing. But I did uh, 8,300 records last week. And I I put a request in to move on and ask for them to give me a complete international dump from 2001 to 2017. And they're thinking about it. So you are so balanced on right and left hemisphere. I mean, it's it's astonishing to me, which sends me to this whole consciousness and uh, mind track. How did you become an ordained Buddhist nun, and how did that involve your remote viewing stuff? How did all that come about? When was that? Um, very high level synopsis. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was raised Roman Catholic. Okay. Okay. And I walked away from it at seventeen years old and said, "This is baloney." Uh huh. And uh, not that I wasn't a spiritual person. I come from a family of clairvoyance. OK, oh, so that that wasn't the issue. The uh-huh. issue was what I felt that what they were teaching was a fairy tale. I see. And because of the clairvoyance that ran in my family, uh, it's safe to say we see a very different world than most people see. There was a, an awareness there and it just didn't match up with what they were talking about in Scripture. You know, uh-huh. I'll give you one example. We had a kid when I was in school. His uh, his father died of a burst appendix. Okay, I was about third grade, and the nuns were saying, "Oh yes, Stevie's father's in heaven with God." Uh-huh. And I looked across the classroom and saw Stevie sitting there at his desk, and I could see Stevie's father standing behind him. So that's the kind of thing that I dealt with as a kid. I saw a different world. Good God! And, uh, at least what, the pastor knew about it. And he used to have me come over on Wednesdays for peanut butter and jelly sandwich and a glass of milk. And he used to remember the old wall and sack tape recorders, those big 3M wall and sack tape recorders. Uh-huh, uh-huh. He put on a big, re- a big reel of tape and he pressed the record button and talked to me and asked me questions about my dreams. Really? Yeah. What? And, and 
you, you have to imagine what this guy looks like. Um, remember John Houseman, like like on yeah. paper, the movie Paper Chase, you uh-huh. know, very big, uh-huh. rough guy. Yeah. Father Gilfoyle looked like him. <laughs> Okay, so imagine I'm a third grader and there's this big, gruff, you know, gray haired guy sitting there in a T-shirt and having a peanut butter jelly sandwich and cookies with me at lunchtime. And he's record- asking me questions about things I had seen. I freaked a lot of the nuns out. I used to tell kids in school what they were going to get for their birthday. The nuns would tell everybody, no, Costas just um, guessing. Well, again, this priest started re- interviewing me and talking to me on a regular basis, and he wasn't sharing anything with anybody. And the bottom line was, one day I came in, and I was real troubled about the dream. And he says, well, tell me about the dream. And I said, well, I see sister so-and-so, and I saw her fall down a flight of stairs. And I saw her wrapped in a great big ribbon of, like, big ribbon of red. And there were swords and dragons and he said, what? All right. I used to have, as a kid, I had a prediction window of about six weeks. Okay. It's much bigger now, but as a kid, about six weeks. And when it happened, and it did happen, uh, the sister fell down a flight of stairs and went ha- in the in the ca- convent. And you know, like uh, stairs, they put carpet on. They used to put like these little brass bars in the corner to kind of hold the carpet ribbon down. Yeah. And, uh, one of those came loose and she went head over tin cup all the way down the stairs and had compound. And I saw, oh, by the way, I saw bone and blood. She compound fractured her calf. And when they found her at the bottom of the stairs, she had been helping the sixth grade teacher correct art drawing projects from, and they were studying the crusades. So what was she laying among? She was laying there on the steps in pain bloody leg, bone sticking out of her leg, and all around her were pictures of knights, shields, dragons, swords. Yeah. So I was a kid that was going to go into a religious order. Please understand this. From first grade, I wanted to go into a religious order. I realized by the time I was 17, there just wasn't a place for me. Your audience probably hears my voice. So yes, I used to be a boy person. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh-huh. And I changed that about 25 years ago. Uh-huh. Okay. When I was 35. Okay. All right. I had planned to go into the seminary to be a priest. Mm-hmm. And it was the weekend. It was Friday night, the night that the Apollo 13 astronauts returned from their harrowing adventure around the moon with a broken spacecraft. Ah, uh, Yes. And on the evening news, there was another story, and they showed some country, probably Africa or Asia, some bony little babies, you know, that kind of thing. Kids are starving in that country or something like this, Mm -hmm. right along with the Vietnam War news and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. The plan was I was supposed to go to a seminary in the fall. Mm -hmm. And what happened was the pastor saw me tear up during the newscast. And he started giving me a hard time. If you're going to be a priest, you're going to have to be tougher than that. And I backed down. I wasn't going to get in confrontation with him. And then he st- just dug into me. And next thing you know, I kind of let loose. And the two of us had a knockdown, drag out argument. Yeah. And uh, they pulled my sponsorship. Well, you weren't suited for it anyway, were you? I think that's what that confrontation bore out, that you were not suited to be of service in that particular denomination. So you still, though, felt a strong calling in that regard. And so that's what led you to an alternate kind of um, spiritual path? Yeah. So the bottom line was uh, I went in the Air Force coming right out of high school. Mm -hmm. What I had planned to do for most of my childhood years wasn't going to happen. Uh-huh. So I joined the service. I volunteered for Vietnam, for God's sakes. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I, I guess in the back of my mind, between that feminine voice in me mm-hmm. crying to get out and my whole conflict of having lost my, my Vocation. spiritual grounding, oh, uh-huh, uh-huh. I just wasn't interested. So I, w- I went over to Vietnam, okay. probably half expecting to get killed. Uh, yeah. Well, my grandmother on my father's side comes came from the Azores. She was one of these ladies in the village that you went to to find out what kind of baby you were going to have. <laughs> yeah. She was a shaman type lady. Uh-huh. So I started practicing in that realm of stuff. And I met some Native Americans when I was over in Southeast Asia and everything. 
And uh, some of the, a couple of them looked at me one day and says, you have absolutely no idea what Coyote has in store for you, my friend, you know, and they could tell I had that second sight. They knew I had it. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And uh, it was very obvious. Mm-hmm. And uh, to, to people who knew what they were looking at. And uh, bottom line, I for 25 years, I practiced shamanism, Wicca shamanism, depending on what you want to look at. I ran pretty much with the shamanic Wicca crowd. Hmm. I rose up to be quite a serious high priestess, okay, had a lot of students, uh-huh. and then in 1994, I had, uh, in fact, I produced the cable television show in Washington, D.C. in 1991 to 1992 about yeah. American witchcraft and shamanism. Right. It was only supposed to have six episodes. We ended up producing 70-something because... The world press, Larry King and everybody else showed up and said, wow, this is the first time anybody's ever done this. Mm-hmm, it's mm-hmm, a long story mm-hmm. on it. That's a show by itself, my friend. <laughs> okay, so what happens? Uh, in 1994, I get this letter. It's not a brochure. It's a personal letter from somebody I do not know uh-huh. inviting me to New Mexico to do a retreat in the High Jemez Mountains. And I, I first thing in my mind, I says, Ugh. I don't have the money to do this, but I, I gave the letter over to a friend of mine who's a, uh, is a Cherokee guy. He's a lawyer. He represented the native tribes in federal court and he checked it out. I mean, a few phone calls found out it was legit. He says, you're not going out there to somebody who's going to shoot you. You're going out there to something deeply spiritual. He says, I would recommend that you go and I recommend you put your affairs in order before you leave. You might not want to come back. So I said, uh, okay, fine. I didn't have the money for it. I didn't have the vacation for it. Well, one of my students fished the letter out of the garbage can, took a collection up with my 119 students. They bought an airline ticket for me. I was just going to cash it in and give the money to charity or something because I, was, I didn't have the vacation. But lo and behold, a few weeks later, Somebody at work, because I'm a transsexual person, got very upset with me, threw a chair at me at work. And the corporate shrink took me aside and he said, I don't think you are the problem, but you are the problem from a social standpoint. I've got to deal with these other people. If I give you like comp time, can you go hide for two or three weeks and keep out of trouble? I said, you know, I got this letter inviting me to come hang out with the shamans in New Mexico. Go, go hang out with the shamans. Wow. That's what he said. Pretty serendipitous. Now, if that doesn't tell you you got to go, yeah, yeah, nothing does. Yeah, yeah. So I went out there. We spent like a week in the High Himes Mountains, uh, got my spiritual butt kicked, okay? And that's all I can tell you about it. When I came back, I was pretty fried, mm. okay? Totally fried. I came back from that thing, and I went ahead and put all my stuff away for two years. I went into retreat for two years. I went to work every day. But I came home and I did not do anything. I was told, go home, write, and take take a vacation from your Wicca. And I did for two years. And then one day, and of course, two o'clock in the morning, I was getting up every night and drawing in this sketchbook. I was All this dream stuff was coming out. And eventually, it led me to a monastery in the, uh, in the uh, Washington, D.C. suburbs. And I took it and showed it to the monks and nuns there. And he said, well, you need to talk to Kempo. That means dean or headmaster. And this was this is the guy who was the head Orthodox Tibetan monk uh, lama for North America. And I hung out with the Buddhists for about six months. I worked in their kitchen on Sunday, cooking the Sunday dinner type of thing with other people. And after about six months, I couldn't stand the Buddhists as far as I could throw them. Okay, <laughs> to be honest with you. Why? And um, – uh, they were Americans, and they were uh, they were on the uh, on the pretentious side, if you if you ask me. Oh, okay. I was pretty much done with it. I wasn't gonna I wasn't gonna hang out with them. Uh. And then I get a call from uh, one of the monks who ran the kitchen. He said, "Tashi, help, help, help!" I said, "What?" He says, "Kempo's here." Now they had told me when I first hung out with them that I should take my little sketchbook and go see Kempo, mm-hmm. show him. And this was eight months later. And like I said, I, I couldn't stand these people anymore. So I said, okay, I'll come help out in the kitchen. They, I always made great hors d'oeuvres. Okay. So I went over there to work on this stuff. I figured I'll never see Kempo because I'm back here in the back room of the kitchen and no one's ever going to come back here and see me. I figured 
okay, that's it. After I do these hors d'oeuvres, I'm not going to hang out here anymore. That's how that came to be. He picks me out of a crowd of 150 people and says, I know you. That's a big deal with Tibetans. The girl who was helping me in the kitchen, he looked at her and said, I know you too. And he looks back at his entourage and said, these two hang out together lifetime after lifetime. Nice to see you again. And he toddles off. And one of his monk entourage comes up to me and says, I've known him 15 years. He plays it close to his chest. I've never seen him do that until 20 minutes ago to an Australian lady who was visiting here. I'd go talk to him. So I got on his calendar for a 15-minute appointment. I went in to talk to him. He had my book. He's looking at this stuff. And he says, so what were you raised in this lifetime? I said, Roman Catholic. Still Catholic? I said, no, I've been running with the shamans for 25 years. Oh, still doing the yogi stuff, huh? I said, I've done all of this before? He says, are you good at it? I said, very good at it. He said, do you think you learned it all in one lifetime? And we got into a 90-minute discussion. And at the end of the 90-minute discussion, I'm down on my knees and said, you're a lama. You can't lie to me on this. He says, no, I can't. I says, okay, I've been a monk, a nun, a yogi many lifetimes. He says, yes, you've, you've done this. Stuff. I, I've been in this tradition, this lineage many times. He said, many lifetimes. I said, have you been my teacher in previous lifetimes? He says, yes, many times. He says, have I ever been your teacher? He says, no, you're too stupid. <laughs> but much later, when I got permission to wear robes, the monks and nuns at the, the particular monastery or temple we're talking about didn't like me. I creeped them out. Remember, I'm a transsexual person. I, I, my androgyny throws a lot of people a, a real curve. Uh-huh, uh-huh. The head monk who gives out the robes when people get permission to wear robes wouldn't give me a set. Huh. So I went home and I made a set. Okay. Yeah. I sold, you know, so yeah. I went home and made a set. And I, when the first time I wore it over there, the monks and nuns got all upset with me. Oh, you didn't make it right. You did this wrong. You did that wrong. I still continued to wear them. Kempo comes back to town a couple of weeks later, takes a look at me and say, oh, old world cut. How'd you learn how to do that? No. Yeah. Oh, God. So well, uh, he says, now do you believe me? He says, you know, and uh, that's how I got to be. Uh, I was a temporary nun for a year and then. I requested to be able to take uh, longer term vows and they turned me, uh, the local ordination board turned me down. They sat there, five of them sitting there in front of me and the monk who was leading in, he says, uh, well, we think you're confused. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, we don't think you know what you are. And I looked at him, I said, I know exactly what I am. You don't know what I am. Uh And they said, well, we're not going to recommend you for ordination. Got Just because of left. your sexuality? That's why? Gender, you know. I can't believe they were that close-minded. They didn't see a person. That belies their faith. You would think so. Because the spirit is independent of the flesh, you know. Uh, so, But and, you did and, get ordained. Yeah, I made a point of that. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. But it, what happened was, um, I when I was going in for my interview, I saw one of the other nuns come running out, and she was in bloody tears uh-huh. and she wouldn't say anything she went come and running out and she ran outside well i found out later she had been turned down because she hadn't been in a 12-step program long enough oh. okay so i left I, I went home i took my robes off and started dressing in my shaman clothes and a friend of mine called me up and says hey i hear you're not going to be a nun I said, well, looks like it so want to go up to a sweat lodge up with, um, you know, Chief So-and-so? Yeah, yeah, okay. You know, jumped in the car. We went up to Baltimore, this one Cherokee, Cherokee uh, Dakotan guy up there. So we went up there and did, a, did one of his sweat lodges. What was weird was about a week later, this is two weeks out from the, from the ordinations, okay? About a week later, when the senior nuns who had sat in that tribunal, uh, not tribunal, it was, a pent- uh, it was five people. And she was one of the senior nuns, she says, we haven't seen you. Is everything okay? I said, no, everything's not okay. You didn't want me, so I left, you know? Mm. And he said, well, such and such, the other nun who got booted, said she filed an appeal with holiness, and she's been approved. Why don't you do that huh. if you still feel strongly about it? I said, okay, I'll consider it. And she said, well, if you're going to get ordained, you're going to need this, that, and the other thing for ordination robes. I said, yeah, I already have that. 
And she says, what do you mean you already have that? And I said, I made my own robes last time, and I made everything I need for ordination because somewhere deep inside of me, I've been through this before. And I got up to see Kempo, who was translating for holiness when he came to town, and went to look at him. I was in civilian clothes, as they say. And the Kempo looked at me and said, what are you dressed that way for? And I said, well, I was told they don't want me. And he, he, he sort of snickered, and he says, yeah, I heard about that. He says, that's so stupid. I said, okay. He says, so what's the deal? He looks at me and says, if we ordain you a boy, is that okay? I said, a lot of paperwork, but yeah, okay, if that's what you want to do. He says, if we ordain you a girl, is that okay? I said, a lot less paperwork. Yeah, it'd be a lot easier. He says, what if holiness looks in your eyes tomorrow and does not says, no, you can't be ordained? I says, well, you gave me yogi vows two years ago. I guess I go back to wearing white and burgundy. He says, okay, show up tomorrow, get a haircut. Uh, when I see holiness the next morning, this is six o'clock in the morning. Nobody's there at the temple except the monks and nuns. Uh, he looks in my eyes and looks and says, none. What, what's the problem here? Hmm. Okay. So th- that was it. Well, when I came out of being ordained, the nuns didn't want me and the monks didn't want me. God. Well, that sucks. So I went and hid for a week. I got a phone call from Kempo's aide, come over and see him. I looked at him and I says, uh, well, they don't want me here. He says, tell you what, I want you to go out in the suburbs and start a small center someplace. And we got out a map and he made a couple of suggestions and let's put it on the metro line there. Oh, let's do it up there in Wheaton, Maryland. You know, okay, fine. So I got an apartment up in Wheaton, Maryland. I started doing a boot. I started setting up a Buddha center. Now, normally when you get ordained as a nun or a monk, you're supposed to be with a, a Lama for like five, 10 years before, before you go out and do anything like this. And I oh. asked him, I said, wait a minute, you're asking me to go out and do something I shouldn't be doing for another five to 10 years. He said, you already know how to do it. Just go do it. You've done it before. Just go do it again, connecting to these past lifetimes. So that's how I got to be a Buddhist nun, and I ran a center there in Wheaton, Maryland for a few years, and then, uh, this is back around 98 time frame, and then in uh, 2003, I went to upstate New York and ran a center up in uh, the uh, Corning Elmira area up there in Uh the southern tier of New York, Uh and I was the uh, Buddhist chaplain for four hospitals within about a 30-mile range of there, and uh, still got the badges to prove it, you know? (laughs) It's, It's hard for me to imagine how shamanism and Buddhism connect. I, I don't understand that, really. They, they don't oh, seem like they should be one and the same. They are. They are, actually. Okay, uh, let's, let's go back a little bit. Let's go to Tibet, a thousand years ago. Yeah. A thousand years ago, a guy came from India. His name was Padma Sambhava. Came from India, and the first people he taught Buddhism to were the shamans in Tibet. They saw the logic in Buddhism, okay? Uh And in in what I'm going to call real, distilled, what Buddha taught Buddhism. There's many, many, many traditions of of Buddhism these days, and you see books that are two inches, three inches thick about Buddhism. What Buddha wrote is about an 80-page book. Basic Buddhism is very simple. Mm -hmm. It's all Mm -hmm. the layers of stuff, different traditions and stuff, and The bottom line is this. He taught the shamans first. In Tibetan Orthodox Buddhism, Nyingma Nyingma tradition, Tolyol tradition, okay, this is the real Orthodox guys, the Dalai Lama's reformed, okay? So if you did it in Christian terms, my tradition are the Greek Orthodox guys with the big hats and big beards, Uh and the Dalai Lama's the Episcopalian guy out here, bells and smells, and that's it, okay? (laughs) We think he's a radical. (laughs) <laughs> okay. No, we, we revere him very much, but you see my point. I, I get He's it. part uh-huh. of the reformed tradition. Uh huh. Uh huh. All right. So, what ended up happening here was uh, the monks and nuns in Maryland, uh, at my tradition, would not have me live with them. Uh-huh. Some Burmese monks took a liking to me, okay. took pity on me, and invited me to come live with them in a townhouse they owned up in Germantown, Maryland. Uh-huh. which I did, uh-huh. and it was probably the best four years of my life. I had a blast with those guys. Okay, <laughs> Of course, you've never heard country western music sung until you've heard it in Burmese. <laughs> I've been around Burmese a lot. <laughs> they they have a lovely lilt to everything they say. 
Oh, yeah. So um, they like having me around because I was what they call Manyahana Varjiana tradition, and they they were Theravada. So while we have two different branches of Buddhism there, uh, at supper time we always had the best monastic arguments, which was fun. Okay, <laughs> but uh, that was the bottom line. And then uh, th- so that's how I got to be a nun. And when it came time for me to let go of my robes, I had intentions of ha- living out my life in those burgundy robes. Uh huh. And in, in uh, 2004, I went to see the Lama. Because remember, he sent me to upstate New York by myself. And when he sent me there, he said, we're going to send you to your mountaintop. Oh. Okay, isolation. And so I went up there, upstate New York. I was bored out of my mind. Uh, they didn't, everybody that was Buddhist there was Zen or Theravada. And again, I was like having a Ruth, Russian Orthodox priest in an Episcopalian town. So uh, bored out of my mind and having a good theater background, I started a murder and mystery dinner theater, in which that town sorely needed for tourist trap type stuff. And it was the hot ticket. And after about two, almost three years there, I went to my Lama and I told him about a realization I'd had in my meditation. And he looked at me and he said, what has that taught you? And I said, I'm no longer qualified to be a Buddhist nun. And he looked at me and he says, you're welcome to continue wearing the robes or you can go back to your, or your, your yogi robes. I said, I'm going to go back to my yogi robes. And that's it. And because I'm in yogi robes now, theoretically, uh, I can uh, be married. Oh. And, 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 that, and it was about a year later or about two years later that Linda and I connected. So there's less strictures with your yogi robe. Now tell me this. Oh no! Actually, 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 there's twice the structures. It's just different. It's the same dharma. It's just a different approach to it. Okay. Now, so then, how did you get? Now my head is swimming. Every time I talk to you, Cheryl, there's all these layers I'm peeling up. How did you then get to remote viewing? Uh, I worked for a radio station in um, D.C. back in the late '90s. By the time I was becoming a, a, a nun. Uh huh. And uh, again, remember, I, I, I was raised in a clairvoyant family. Yes. So this stuff was not alien to me. And I heard a guy by the name of Dr. Courtney Brown talking about remote viewing on one of the talk shows. When I was engineer, I was working in the control room. I was I was engineering uh, the, the overnight stuff oh, for somebody uh-huh. who was sick. Uh-huh, okay. And I listened to this guy and I said, wow, that sounds interesting. So I got books on, on, on remote viewing and read up on it. A few years later, the... Farsight Institute that Dr. Brown had established wanted to do a, a, a class in New York City, but they wanted like $1,500 to come. And the hotel costs in a New York City environment was like $400, $400 a night. You know, it's ridiculous. So I reached out to them and I said, what if I could get you hotel rates of around $50 a night and I'll give you a free space to do it? I'll let you use my monastery here for your classes. And there's a off-season golf course a half a mile up the road that will give you give your hotel rooms for forty dollars fifty dollars a night huh. they jumped on that uh-huh. and so uh-huh. all these people from new york city and new jersey came up to go to the class i had gone down to a store that rents all tables and stuff for weddings and everything i rented a bunch of conference tables and we threw the farsight institute class for remote viewing in my monastery i managed it it was my business so i went ahead and had them had them do it there and I got to go to the classes for free. So it worked out very well for everybody. And uh, this was a very good class. And we all did in four days what he said, the instructor said usually takes three weeks with most people. So it was a unique class. Wow. And that's how I got interested in remote viewing. And then in the years that followed, I taught remote viewing on my own with, uh, with students that I had, Buddhist students and Wicca students that I had, and went from there. And I've learned an awful lot about it that, that is not published in books. Uh-huh. So and I've thought about writing a book about it, but uh, I've learned a, a lot about it over the years since that time. Huh. Now, when, when you, God, there's just, now there's a gazillion other questions to ask. Can I bring one, can I bring one thing up? Please. The, the Burmese monks took me to a ceremony at a Sri Lankan temple just outside of D.C., and it was a big celebra- a particular celebration, holy day kind of thing. And all the lay people came and brought tons of food and all this kind of stuff. And um, I'm like the only Tibetan tradition there. Everybody else is either Sri Lankan or Burmese. And we were there and I 
literally was trying to find my way back into the main house, where, which is their main, their main temple space, to, to find a bathroom. And what I didn't know was they have a small auditorium in there, and I went in the wrong door and found myself literally on stage. And they were having a, a discussion about Buddhism. And they had all these Lama guys up there, you know. Uh, they had Korean, they had um, Burmese, they had uh, uh, Sri Lankan, that kind of thing. So uh, they said, ah, Tashi, come sit, sit. And they got the big lazy boy recliner there, and I sat down. It was a debate. I figured, oh, my God, you know, you got all these guys that are Ph.D.-level Buddhists, and I'm sitting here like, you know, I'm on the Sunday school version of a Buddhist. You know, I'm going, oh, my God, I'm in trouble. So the guy who was moderating the discussion was an American Thai monk. And I figured my safest thing is to just agree with what everybody else said. And they're going along one by one. They get to me. And they said, Tashi, how do we make Buddhism uniquely North American? Buddhism always adapts itself to whatever new culture it goes to. Uh Right now, most Buddhism, for your audience, most Buddhism that's here in the United States is essentially imported. If you tell me it's Thai or it's Japanese or Korean or uh, Burmese or something like that, it's imported. Mm-hmm. Okay. There is an effort afoot by a lot of American Buddhists to make a uniquely North American flavored Buddhism. That's oh. a different topic matter. Uh, so I looked at it and I struggled and I said, well, you're not going to like my answer. And there's 200 Sri Lankans in the audience. They said, well, tell us what you think. And I said, well, first thing we have to do is lose the Asian baggage. You got to heard a pin drop. <laughs> they said, what do you mean? I said, first thing, you, you, you might want to start treating women less like property. Buddhist nuns are not property. Of course, they got a discussion going, well, they got 300 more vows than the men. And I said, yeah, but they carry the responsibility of the reproductive process. Of course, they have more responsibility. Hmm. So I went, I went nine rounds on this stuff with these people. And I said, look, we're, we're taught that the soul essence doesn't have a gender so why are you treating them and telling me uh, why for the last 10 centuries you've been telling us that the female birth is an inferior birth? It is not. Buddha ordained men and women equally. And then I pulled one more thing out of my hat and I said, in the Vinaya, which is the scriptures Buddha wrote, I said, a monk or a nun can change gender up to three times in one lifetime. And then vows will transmute with them. And of course, all the lamas say, oh, no, no, no. And this Korean lama at the fire end said, no, Tashi's right. It's there in the Vinaya. And one of the arguments I said is, hey, you show you how, how unequal we are. There's four or five nuns here. There's probably 75 monks here. And we're going to go out there to get some of that beautiful food from the lay people in about an hour with our begging bowls. And you're going to make the nuns sit over there on a little, little card table over there in the corner. And you can have all the monks set up here at this nice big table. I said, you call that equal? About an hour later, we're out there going through uh, the, the line. And me and the three other three girls went to go sit down at the little table we had. And we looked over at the other table. And the other monks were pointing at the empty chairs at the end of their table. They wanted us to sit with them. And the two Thai nuns that were with me saying, oh, my God, we can't do this. And I said, hey, ladies, they outrank us. Let's go over and sit at their table. So we sat down at their table. And as we sat down, when the nuns said, I don't know about this. And I said, honey, we just climbed Everest. <laughs> okay. I thought that was the end of it. About six months later, Kempo comes to town. I'm his duty driver. Okay. I'm driving him around D.C. to all the different things he's got. He's got a talk down in Alexandria. He's got a talk, you know, down in D.C. He's got one over in Maryland. I'm driving every place he has to go, right? We're on Rockville Pike in Maryland. He likes Colonel Chicken, four-piece chicken meal. So I'm driving him up to Kentucky Fried Chicken, and we're at a long eight-minute light. And out of nowhere, he says, so I hear we have to lose the Asian baggage. And I am melting in my chair thinking, oh, my God, I am so screwed here, you know. And I said, I didn't say anything wrong. It's the truth. He says, yes, I know it's the truth. He says, I can't tell that truth because I'm the head of Orthodox Tibetan tradition in North America. But you can. He said, go ahead. Preach that truth. He said, if it gets too uncomfortable, we'll disavow you. We can do that too, you know. <laughs> and that was that was the flavor of it, you know. Huh. So he basically gave me permission to teach 
American Buddhism. Oh. Non-sectarian American Buddhism. Huh. Wow. Teach the basics. Keep away. From, if I keep away from their Tibetan doctrine, I don't have any conflict of interest because I'm just teaching basic principles that you can look up on the internet. I see. So you okay. can create a specialized flavor and still adhere to the main um, precepts that are important to that that spirituality. Yeah, and I'm not the only one. There's a bu- there's a bunch of us out here that have gone into a lay mode, a quasi lay mode, and uh, even though we're still, I'm still technically a Buddhist nun. Yeah. Okay. All they did was relax my vows. Okay. I only wear my yogi robes when I when I have to do a teaching. Okay. Otherwise, I just dress like a regular civilian, or if I have to go to a special event of some sort, and you got to dress up for it. But whenever I get an opportunity to talk Buddhism. I, uh, my wife comes with me. Mm-hmm. She's Zen. Mm-hmm. I'm Tibetan Orthodox, and we can sit there and give you the best blend mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. talk. Hmm. And that's what we do. This is all consciousness stuff here. So uh, there's a lot of discussion about the possibility that consciousness is involved in the UFO phenomenon. So what are your thoughts on that, especially you with your background you of betcha. Buddhism? You betcha. Yeah, so expound on that. When I first started hearing about the CE5 stuff, and I started reading what they were talking about, yeah. again, because I write a weekly column, I got to have something to write about. Right, right. And I started seeing, I wasn't going to contradict Dr. Greer's writings, but I did see some benefit to saying, look, uh, I spent seven years in a Buddhist monastery. I know a little bit about consciousness, and I know a lot about meditation. And if you're going to do good CE5 stuff, here's some things we've learned over 2,000 years about meditation. Okay? And I started writing a series. I wrote a series of articles, how to make your meditation practices better so that you can do better CE5 type of operations. I read that column. I read that one. Yes. How did that contradict um, Dr. Uh, you just, Dr. Greer? Yeah. How, that, yeah. how does that well, contradict? It doesn't, con- oh. it doesn't contradict it at all. Um, oh. I mean, they want you to get into a, they want you to get into a, an altered state of consciousness, non-drug induced one. And meditation is the best way to let all of that go. Uh, in fact, one of my better articles was t- tell them, like, okay, this is the stuff you you should and should not eat if you're going to do meditation uh-huh, for uh-huh. one of these events. Yeah, yeah, that's you know? what I read. There's yes. c- certain food they found out for years. Don't eat stuff that makes you gassy, like, you know, uh, onions and garlic and things like that, you know. Uh-huh. So I, re- I shared all this kind of stuff in a, in a series of four or five articles, and I made a good case. I think the CE5 people are onto something. Also, so- I had talked to llamas. Who yeah. have attracted these things to come down? Well, what are these things, Cheryl? The UFOs? Yeah, they're craft. Yes, but what's in them? Beings. And and beings that Sen- that sen- sentient beings that connect with consciousness from from these sentient beings on this sphere. Is that what you're thinking? I I don't know. So that's what okay, I'm wondering. Okay, let's use George Lucas here. Uh, the Force connects and binds all living things together throughout the universe. All living things, all sentient little things, every every little thing that crawls on the ground is connect, has some level of life force, and that life force is connected to the great consciousness of everything. Okay. Okay? Yes. Uh-huh. And that's it. And they're connected to the same consciousness we're connected to. And if we aren't aware of that, it's only because we've got this dualistic thinking, and this is a big deal in Buddhism, to think that we are separate from the great consciousness. We're not. We're all connected. Yes, now, exactly. well, then let's talk a bit about that. You know, there's people talk about aliens and there's different kinds of aliens and everything. So there's just different kinds of beings and those are aliens. And that's why people are seeing uh, a varying cast of characters. Yeah. Yeah. When I was doing that talk at that monastery, when I was talking about the, you know, uh, how to make Buddhism uniquely North American, uh-huh. one of the arguments that I threw out there and said, look, And I said it very frankly, and I said, look, we've all lived in other lifetimes, in other places where we had different biology. And Mm -hmm. not a a monk up the row shook his head no. Everyone, they're all nodding their head up and down yes. I said, our lifetimes are one after another, and uh, it doesn't matter what world 
or what environment or what reproductive process we have on those worlds or those dimensions, it's still life. It's still a sentient consciousness existence. That's the whole thing. And I hear people all the time, especially at UFO conferences, you know, oh, yeah, I want to meet aliens. But those same people will look down at me because I'm a trans person and I'm very obvious and open and out about it. Uh huh. Uh -huh. I said, how are you going to accept these aliens uh -huh. when you don't if accept you can't me? accept the diversity within your own species, for God's sakes? Yeah. There's a great line from ba the old Babylon 5 TV series. Yeah. Some of the more bigoted people on in that program's character set would refer to the aliens as snakeheads. That was their slang term. Oh, I, I came up here to, you know, a box with a bunch of snakeheads, you know, a line like that, you know. So it, we're going to have that problem when we do engage the off-worlders yeah. and the off-dimension people. Yeah. We're going to have to deal with the fact that we can't even deal with the with the diversity in our own human species. Right. Let alone, I don't think we're ready to talk to these people off-world yet. You know, well, certain people uh, I are. like it. I mean, I would love for them to land on the White House lawn, but I don't think we're ready for it. But certain people are, and there's varying degrees of of um, one's spiritual development. Yes, yes yeah. very much so. Okay, so I'll tell you, I'll tell to, well, let me say it to you this way. Uh, I suspect you have probably touched an alien, uh, an off-worlder in your interactions at one of these conferences or perhaps on the subway, and you don't even know it. Uh huh. That's possible. There's no doubt of that. Yeah. DC was crawling with them. <laughs> yeah, DC's crawling. Never. With a lot I don't of see stuff. the world. I don't see the world the way most people see the world. Yeah, clearly. Okay. Well, tell me this. Now, this is one of the things that always gets me. You know, you talk to people who are highly educated in the sciences, and and it starts and ends with the fact. Well. Uh, sure, they're probably out there because there's so many planets, blah, 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 blah. But they can't get here yet because nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. And that's the end-all, be-all of how inside the box they are. So how do you suppose these beings are getting here that we're seeing in our skies and you're putting in charts and graphs in your book? All right. I, I had one of these kind of um, uh, arguments with a, uh, a guy with a Ph.D. in physics and a Ph.D. in chemistry here about four months ago online. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And I said, look, when Columbus came here, it took him, what, three, three and a half months to get here. And uh, they just tested a, they're, they're testing a, a supersonic craft that will get here in three hours, three and a half hours. Right. In a couple of days. Uh, I said, you know. We didn't know how to do it 200 and 300 years ago, but we learned how. I said, maybe they're quite a bit ahead of us and they've learned, they've gone around the physics. Well, physics says we can't do that. I said, well, maybe we don't know that kind of physics yet. Well, maybe it's there. Hell, if you read the Serpo papers, if, the, if they're the, valid, the even, I, I don't know that we can take face. Valid, yeah. And, and if they aren't well, valid, it's, evidence, it's a red herring. A evidence that suggests that it is. Well, yeah, but let me just say here that lots of people in this field, especially the nuts and bolts faction, they're looking for answers in the scientific method. But of course, doing that negates any consideration of consciousness connection and, and that type of thing, which is, it's important when you're wrestling with this phenomenon, but you, you can't just uh, believe something's true. You have to kind of responsibly be able to present some coherent logical justification for your belief. Otherwise, it's not really advancing knowledge. And somebody can just make something up or proffer some papers that, that pretends to say something. It doesn't mean it's true. And people are headed off on strange little trails in that way. That always makes me nervous. And one of the, the Serpico papers or whatever is one of those things that that's just somebody could be making something up. That doesn't mean it's true. And how much are we supposed to base what we believe off that kind of thing? Okay. Um, I, I'm okay with that explanation. Let's back away from Serpo a moment. Okay. Let's talk about the nuts and bolts guys that don't even want to hear about this squishy consciousness stuff. Right. Now that, that I can okay. go with. Okay. Let's go there a minute. Okay. In the classes that I've taught over 20 years, and I don't just teach one class. If someone comes into my class, it's a commitment for about a year. You're, you're going to be, we're going to teach you basic remote viewing, and then we're going to get together for, in fact, we'll do that every week for about two months. And then 
thereafter, we do it about once a month. We'll sit down and have a session, uh-huh. okay, where we'll spend an afternoon and we'll do three or four targets, okay? And I don't know what the targets are. I have third-party people stuffing my envelopes, so they're double and triple blinded. I have no idea what's on those target cards half the time. Right. Okay? Yeah. In fact, most of the time, I, I don't. I have other people stuff them for me. Okay. Um, what's interesting is is that my, my peers in the remote viewing class, and what I'm going to call it a little bit of a society, um, uh, we've sent them some very interesting places, and they've documented some very interesting things. Right. And, and, of course, the nuts and bolts people don't want to hear about this. So, yeah, I, I can see that the nuts and bolts kind of group, they can they can maybe go with remote viewing because they know they haven't figured out where the mind lives yet. And uh, they can't just uh, explain it as being neural connections. They know it's something more than that. So they will kind of scratch their, their Van Dyke beard and go, hmm, when it comes to questions about remote viewing. I think they can probably see that's plausible because of the hard mind question. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, it's where 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 is the observer parked in your body? You know, so uh, yeah. The, the bottom line, as far as I'm concerned with it, is is that all my all my students eventually remember I've got a couple of hundred cards sitting there in the in the bucket, and some of them are recycled and restuffed at a later date for another class. And the one card that comes up frequently it happens to be that target card where we send them onto the backside of the moon and they meet these other people. They're on the backside of the moon. And every single class of four classes, we're talking probably upwards of 30 people have gotten that. And they, they come out of the session. They don't know what the target is. And they sit there. We go through the debriefing and they're sitting saying, well, whoever these people were, they were aware we were there and they didn't like the fact that we were there. This has been a consistent answer. And, and, and it was the kind of answer that Ingo Swan, the father of remote viewing, got, uh-huh. you know, when he was targeted for a thing like that. So uh, we've had people reach out to some of the UFOs. I'll give you a good example. Um, you know, the, the picture of the gray alien they've got from like the 50s, uh, they, they, they call it uh, Alien Bob or something like that. Yeah. I know a lot of people who have remote viewed him back in the 50s when that picture was taken. And he is aware of the remote viewers. Cross time and space. And uh, and this is a consistent answer I keep hearing from people. So there's something to the squishy consciousness stuff, and I'm there with you. I'm, I'm that person over here, like Obi-Wan Kenobi, saying, guys, there's the force here, and we need to take that into consideration. Maybe we can't get here with a hard, a hard nuts and bolts craft, but we're certainly getting here with consciousness. Uh-huh. They are touching us. And, and, and we've had enough examples of that. And how do we know some of these things that we think are abductions are not abductions and they're coming into our consciousness in one of our sleeping states where they can easily get to us, get to us on a common ground, consciousness, common ground. And uh, that's where the experience takes place. Yeah, when you talk ex- to experiencers, though, there's bad characters and there's good characters. And it almost seems fairy ish that you run into these bad characters and then you also run into the, you know, real nice characters. What's that all about? Who are these people? What are they doing? What's the story behind that? Why are they here? Any clue of that? We're fun to watch. <laughs> I, I, I literally think that a majority of them that are watching us are... Uh, uh, it's everything from a strategic standpoint to simple anthropology. Okay. There, I mean, I, I really think anybody who's hanging around us and not making direct contact most of the time has got to be like an anthropologist. Okay. They're studying our development and learning about themselves by studying our development. Now you talk to Lou Elizondo there of the, uh, to the stars Academy and formerly with the defense department, right. him and I had a nice good hours talk. Uh-huh. And one of the things he's, he told me flat out is that they seem to be loitering around our most advanced technology, particularly the military advanced technology. So there is a concern. And frankly, I think they're concerned. We're going to, uh, we're going to nuke ourselves morbid. Uh-huh. You know, I think they're worried about that because we've got this beautiful blue green planet here and these things are rare in the universe. There's a lot of them out there, but they're still rare. And I think they're a little concerned that we're an inexperienced bunch of children with a pack of really nasty matches 
But you know what? That doesn't that doesn't hold water with me because if it is true that they hovered over Malmstrom Air Force Base and uh, cut the power to active nuke missiles, I just don't buy that they're afraid we're going to blow ourselves up. They can stop all of our missiles from even activating. There's some strange stuff that just doesn't track. And that's one of those things that, oh, they can't interfere because that's part of what their mantra is. We must. Well, they've been interfering, apparently, for generations and generations. Something about this does not add up. Okay, you can go to sinister route and say uh, they want to keep an eye on us uh, and because they don't want us off this rock because they're afraid we're going to eat their relatives. You know, I mean, you know. They could stop that, too. They could stop any. Yes. Anything we wish to do could be thwarted, and I would submit has been thwarted uh, from time immemorial. So I just cannot buy the fact that they're hanging out, you know, just making sure that we don't blow up our own little playpen. I, I don't know what exactly their modus operandi is, but I can't buy that Um I, I kind of often go to Jacques Vallée's thinking of kind of a control mechanism somehow. Uh, but, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know anything. I don't know that anybody has a handle on it, but I always like asking people's, you know, opinions about it. Well, you know, to, to try and put a human model on, on wh- why they're doing what they do, uh, there's a number of players. We know this. We know there's a number of different players up there. Um, we found it in my data. We find, figured out that uh, there was maybe 40 sightings a year over the 15 years of my study for rectangular craft, uh-huh. the rectangular and square craft. Yeah. And in the last uh, 2014, 2015, those those numbers shot up like a rocket, uh, like 200 percent. There's a new player in town. OK, hell, Lou Elizondo knew about that. Uh-huh. Okay, him and I were talking about that. And uh-huh. I said, you know, who's this new player? He said, yeah, we'd like to know, you know. So, you know, do we have other cultures that are not nearly as advanced as maybe the most advanced that are here? And they've got more, they think more like we do and they're, they're, they're hell bent on maybe conquering us at some point. I don't know. Um, do we think like an alien? Do we know what their agenda is? No, no we can, we can surmise, but and that's, that's part of our their problem. logic may be. Say that again? I, I would submit that it is. We always come from a, a human-centric view, which is one of our biggest mistakes. We, I, I, I don't know how much of an alien mind we would understand, except for those people who have purported to have interacted with them and, and had mental conversations that make them sound, if these reports are to be believed, and I think there's a number of them that are accurate and, and true, if these reports are to be believed, these beings are talking to us in much the same way that we would have a human interaction. So... There does seem to be some evidence that these beings are kind of on par with the human species in how they approach and think and and have a sense of humor and and hope and love and trust and that type of thing. But I just I don't know. I don't know. I don't know either. And that's the basis of all research is I don't know. True. Yeah. We just don't know. How's this, you know, this is all dovetailing and there's a lot of disclosure talk about, uh, especially since the latest releases in Luis Alessandro, um, he was involved in in uh, helping with the release of that information. They're treading slowly and I don't blame them. You know, we've been getting drip, drip in like uh, last December 16th. It was, we had drip, drip, splash. Uh-huh. Uh, so it's being fed to us. You still have a lot of people in the mainstream media who thought it was silly a couple of years ago. And suddenly the talk hosts and uh, commentators are don't have the words or even the questions to ask beyond like who's driving them. You know, is it little green men? I mean, they don't know because they don't even have the words to use because they've been so far away from quote the tinfoil hat crew that they, they don't know what we know. Right. And the, uh, we're the bloody experts on this topic matter to some degree. And, uh, and that's the scurry part about it. I, I got a lot of phone calls, a lot, you know, data, my, my data, my book, Art me and Linda's book. Um, a lot of people, even in the UFO community, Oh, it's just charts and graphs and numbers. Okay, fine. New York times 
wrote that article about us. So uh-huh. what happens when the December 16th last year's article comes out, people start Googling New York Times UFO, they get our, our article comes up as well. Uh-huh. So suddenly people are reaching us to us saying, are the numbers that big? And I started giving them the numbers, you know, and they, they go bananas, you know. Right. Yeah. And uh, they can't all be real, you know. And see, they're, they're they're treating themselves to a little bit of denial. They can't all be real. But let's say it's only four percent. That means it's like four or five thousand that are real. It almost seems that government officials are not the problem. It's more a disbelieving mainstream media that doesn't even know enough to ask the right questions. Thank you. Thank you. Why you're That's welcome. That's exactly it. Yeah, so they're part of the problem here because it seems like there is a faction of government that is doling out what they're hoping are bite-sized pieces, and the media can't even get that in their mouth and chew it out and make sense of it. Well, let me give you an example. Uh, when they released the first piece back in 16, uh, December 16th last year with the the fighter footage right yes and everyone looked at the pictures and of course then took the pundits on i think it was like cnn one of the pundits got on there and they had a aero, aerospace expert and he said well somebody's always trying out something new it's probably a chinese or russian somebody's trying out some new advanced craft yeah but nobody was listening to the dialogue track yeah when the guy said wow look at look at it look at how that thing just moved oh my god there's a whole fleet of them now, a whole fleet of them says clear and present danger if they're Chinese or Russians, you know, <laughs> but, or, or in, as Louis, Luis Alessandro and I were talking about, he says, look, you're either our blue team or the Chinese or the Russians or it's somebody else not from around here. And boy, we better learn about them in a hurry. <laughs> and the argument that I made in one of my more recent articles was, you know, We've got a violation of our Constitution, the fact that somebody like Louise, when he was trying to communicate this stuff up to General Mattis, couldn't get it up through the bureaucracy because the bureaucracy wouldn't pass it along. Uh-huh. Nobody wants to be the UFO guy. Nobody wants to be the flying saucer guy yeah. because it's going to be a, 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 there's this whole taint that goes along with it. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I want to I want to thank you very much for talking with me, uh, and I You're welcome. I appreciate the work you guys did. You and Linda put in some yeoman's work on that. It was just an extraordinary uh, accomplishment you did, and I thank you so much for talking with me, Cheryl. You're welcome. Wait till you see the international and the Canadian one. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm looking forward to it, and we'll call you then too. Okay. Okay. Very good. Bye bye now. That was Cheryl Costa, co-author of the book, UFO Sightings, Desk Reference. This 400-page, soft-cover desk reference is available online at a very reasonable price, and I have found it of immediate value in my investigation and research. You can also read Cheryl's online column, New York Skies. It's a simple Google search away. She makes frequent presentations. There are multiple links to various different interviews made with Cheryl, again, easily found via a Google search. Well, that's it for now. I'm Marsha Barnhart. And until next time, thank you for joining me for this episode of API Conversations. API Conversations is a spin-off of API Case Files. This podcast is a production of Aerial Phenomenon Investigations. The spoken content of API Conversations is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 4.0 license, as is the music heard during this program by DJ Spooky. Links to information on this episode of API Conversations are included in the show notes. Be sure to check out our other API Conversations as well as API Case Files at www.apicasefiles.com. We hope you recommend API Conversations and API Case Files 
to your friends and acquaintances.